The emotions of those who are thought to be beautiful are always full of sorrow, and honor tradition disappears in the cry of the weak. Winners of a battle will eventually decline in power and become losers, and then those losers will cultivate a new leader. Trays, what are you trying to get at? I'm telling you, I want to be a loser. And welcome back to Zaku Talk. This season, G versus Wing. And that means my co host today is a friendly elephant. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> I could go for another, but let's not. Yeah. And I am your co host, Pastor Scahill. And of course, on Minding the Audio Boards is Lev Van Rensselaer. This week, we're going to do episode 25 of both shows. But before we get into that, Bob, how's your week been? Well, week has been good. Uh, I lucked out and, uh, a last minute call out for an ADHD meetup happened on Monday. So Tuesday, I actually got my eval done and sometime after the new year, I should have word on whether or not I in fact have ADHD because that would answer a slew of the problems that I've been uh, having as of this series of recordings at the least. Oh my goodness, you have to wait till all the way till next year to find out the results. You're not old enough to make those jokes yet. You don't even have a child. I'll find one. I'd give you a pass there. I'll just take one. If you're going to take any child, yeah. and I mean this, yeah. take the child of a gerbil. I don't want that. I don't want a hand taro. It, 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 if, if you no. don't, the mother might eat it. So Good. It, you're actually doing a great job in rescuing well, this I, thing. I gotta, but then I kill the mother now she goes hungry. No, because she'll just not eat her yun that she doesn't want. It's it's a weird thing. I've seen hamsters do it. I'm understanding that gerbils may do it. Uh, and at the very least, it might be uh, maybe you don't go that way. Maybe you go for another chinchilla. Well, so so after a week and I don't and then I discover I don't want the gerbil child anymore. I can just eat it then. Listen, I don't know what the situation with covid in California is right now. Yeah. But, you know, if if push comes to shove. Okay. I mean, this I, got really dark, <laughs> Scale Hill. Yeah. I don't want to do any pets anyway. I'm over pets. I've moved on. What, anything else going on this week besides being hyper disordered? Uh, well, unconfirmed, but likely. <laughs> Allegedly. Um, I, uh, I have gone ahead and oh i um i'm making a roast right now uh i'm really excited about doing that uh because it it wasn't a prime rib roast it's uh the next step down but oh such good medium rare beef um i'm currently tearing down some of the uh makeshift wall panels i'd made uh in order to uh actively affix a bunch of foam to the walls and then use the boards for uh sound uh manipulation and uh oh i'm prepping to do a recording for next week uh on the 25th which by the way is the day that my game should have a full release mm -hmm. uh i'm also doing a holiday uh gift from a friend of mine to the toku community uh, I'm going to be voicing a main character in a story, so. Okay, very cool there. Yeah, uh, there's still more I could do, but this is what I've got for now. How about you, Scale? Uh, what is going on with me this week? I've got a little pause and being on film sets for a bit, and that will be nice. Allow me to get ahead on um, this animation project I'm working on, um, kind of collect some artists to help with that. Then I'm also working on a screenplay for next year uh, to shoot and return to kind of the world of features and storyboarding this animation project. Nothing, nothing aggressively exciting. A bit of a low-key week for me. Well, you say that, but just to pull it back a bit, how has your... Um NFMLA stuff been going. Have you gotten to see any cool movies lately? So I got to go to the Shanghai one we've already talked about, and then it was sort of those four weekends of shooting right away. Um, 
but I hmm, I haven't gotten an email about something this week. Maybe there's nothing happening this week. Eh, well, it's still early. No, I should. Yeah, sometime today I'll probably get an email and allow to go back. Yeah. So I yeah. Now I should. Now I'll have a couple weeks to kind of go into that in full earnest. Wonderful. All right. So episode twenty five of G Gundam Bob. What happens there? Well, let's start with the title. All fighters gathered. The final battle begins, or in Japanese, Kesho Kaimaku, Gundam Fight Dai Shugo. Uh, so, Kokusho Kaimaku, um, I am going to pull up while you do your title in a moment, but uh, Gundam Fighter, Gundam Fighter, Dai Shugo, uh, I'm going to assume that's Big Battle. I will uh, let you know after I read the summary. Domon arrives in Neo Hong Kong moments before the deadline. The opening ceremonies start and Domon and the others are surprised to learn that Master Asia is back in his Master Gundam. And Mikolo and Chapman are back even though Domon had disqualified Mikolo and Chapman had apparently died. The opening ceremony commences with in- introductions of the Gundams in the finals with a recap of the abilities of the Bolt Gundam, Dragon Gundam, Gundam Maxter, and Gundam Rose. Domon makes an open declaration at the ceremony vowing to win all his matches in the preliminaries in order to fight Master Asia. Oh, that's it. That's the sub- there's more that happens after, isn't there? That that was it. the The bulk of the episode truly is just that. Okay. It's it's a clip show episode. Yeah, that's that's pretty, pretty much what you get there. Easy week for that. Well, but oh, I, I I have good things to say about that when we're done here. Okay, uh, over here in episode twenty five of Catraverse Hero, uh, or in the Japanese, Kataru Basau. Basasu Hiro, uh, which seems pretty easy to translate, is ba, Basasu, this kind of verse yes. against something like that. Yes. Fighting. Hiro. Yeah, it's literally yeah. just the phonetic for verses, but yeah. because they don't have a hard V in Japanese, you'd go to uh, a B. Okay. All right. That's kind of fun. All right. Katra fights Hiro in a vain attempt to demonstrate that the colonies no longer need the Gundams, but when that fails, Troa forces Katra to realize his own kindness by paying the ultimate price. Meanwhile, the Romafella Foundation proposes to replace all Oz mobile suits with their new Virgo mobile dolls, and Trey's is imprisoned when he refuses to support this. Lady Un, who learns of Tuberov's treachery, is shot by him when she unlocks Duo and Wufei's cell, allowing them to escape with their new but incomplete suits. All right, that's what we've got going on here. That's all? That's all that happened? It's, 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 this is your gist. But like that, but it ended. That show ends and like they leave. It felt like there's more, there's like five minutes of show after Domon's like, I'm going to beat everybody. Right? They they linger on that for a little bit uh, because the the finale of that was when Wan Yun fought uh, the uh, current ruler of all space because he is the lead of Neo Hong Kong, yeah. the previous winner. Yeah. Uh, he introduced three new rules. Well, One, t- technically two rules and then like a fun thing. You know, it it's silly, but I don't know if they had given that moniker the last time around. Yeah. So. I'm going to believe that that is the case. It just here. doesn't feel like a rule. It's not like a rule of competition. I, I feel like they may go into more with that later. Uh, my assumption, pure assumption, yeah, is that they're saying that the Gundam of Gundams is it is the pinnacle Gundam, and therefore would maybe be a model by which other nations might have to start building theirs after. It might be that this is the supreme model, and therefore. Uh, no others shall top it. Thirteenth might be the end per what Wang Yun Fat has in mind. Okay, because uh, it does seem off, but nah, uh, there there might be more than meets the eye at the moment. But okay. the first two, for those who are not viewing with us, the first rule change is that uh, all Gundams from this point forward may be destroyed, repaired, and reoptimized as seen fit between now. And the end of uh, what appears to be the preliminary rounds or the semifinals. Yeah. Then you have the second rule. You may now target the cockpit with whatever happens to happen. 
So if it's you punching directly into the chest where the cockpit is on most of these Gundams or, oh, man, this errant bolt of lightning happens to shock right in the middle. Oh, boy. OK, they're fried. OK, I guess should have been stronger. Yep. So it's literally become Mortal Kombat. It has become a death match. Yeah. Feels good to, to, to raise the stakes here uh, in our tournament saga. I'm fine with that. Uh, the translation, by the way, Daishugo, Grand Assembly. Grand Assembly. Yeah, so I took the uh, kanji and katakana here and turned it into uh, Kesho Kaimaku, Gundam Fighter Daishugo, which translates to English directly, one for one. The final starts, Gundam Fighters Grand Assembly. Okay. It's it's the opening of the game. Yeah, yeah, we do our Homeric catalog of ships. Yep, everybody loves that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I just wanted to note before we go in more, you know, I'm now on the second half collection of G Gundam. So I picked that up from Right Stuff. Um, came you know, in relatively quick shipping time. Uh, it's perfectly fine. Case is good. Uh, so go find all of your Gundam related paraphernalia there and a few other anime things if you're just into anime in general. Well, uh, to that end, I will also shill a thing that we are not going to get money for. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get uh, wonderful models uh, of your Gundams that you may be watching at the moment or from years past, definitely check out Bluefin. Bluefin Distributors is a group that we can contact here in the States that is the direct supplier from Bandai to the United States. So you can find a bunch of models ranging from the uh, very minor uh, high grades uh, here and there, but mostly real and master grade quality uh, pieces and a lot of the uh, effect parts, too, at relatively uh, doable prices. So if you want your models that go with your show, check out Bluefin. All right, there you go. So I, the first thing that jumped out at me in this episode was when we're looking at Earth and all the colonies around it is that space Egypt has pyramids just sort of chilling out in space. They thought, hey, we need to feel like home. Let's build these pyramids. That will take up a lot of space in our small colony. And maybe they live in there or maybe we treat them like tombs. Who knows? So remember how we have a whole bullhead as a Gundam? <laughs> I know. Okay, so going from there, I'm going to say that it's probably, once again, visual indicators that are universal, especially in the 90s when people aren't picking up the Encyclopedia Britannica every time something comes up on screen. (laughs) Another indicator uh, where they really want us to think something is when Hong Kong ruler takes off his glasses and he's got red eyes. This is a bad guy. Yeah, he's got red pupils. Mm hmm. Okay, I'm going to have to double check that because I don't think I saw that on uh, my version of the uh, the piece. Uh, but go on. That's it. So like that. I'm like, okay, bad guy. Gotcha. And then yeah. he was doing shady shit the whole time. So there you go. So to that, I'll say there, there are a lot of opinions on how Hong Kong worked in the 90s. Yeah. For some, it was the ideal metropolis. It was it was a nation that was about the freedom that America could offer while still having uh, a Chinese or Pan Asian background. It was it was a thing. I'm using 90s white guy logic here. Other people saw it as a den of shady goings on. And so I think our uh, Yon Wun. Uh, yeah, I. Yon Wun Fat? I don't know his name. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember for myself because I'm the guy that remembers the names for the most part here. Be helpful. Yeah, it's, it's good. Uh, but Fat is a, um, you know, obviously some sort of uh, high roller type, a, a, a man that likes the pleasures of life, hence why we see all these other leaders from the neo-colonies on his yacht yeah. as he prepares <laughs> everybody for the yeah. games. And... A thing that came to mind, uh, someone who was gaining popularity at the time as a filmmaker, was Stephen Chow. So uh, I wondered whether or not uh, maybe that's a nod in that direction or not, Um, because I just as a small tangent, uh, I have not seen any of his like Kung Fu Hustle, Kung Fu Mahjong, things like that. 
Shaolin Soccer is another popular one that he's done. I've seen The Art of Cookery. And The Art of Cookery, surprisingly good for a film that came out between 93 and 95. Yeah, then in the UC timeline, too, Hong Kong is a little bit of a shady place, but it helps out the protagonists because they're usually against the power structures and these guys like are good at exporting things under the radar and stuff like that. Yeah, and I, I wonder how much of that is, honestly, uh, especially at the time, the uh, Japanese mindset where there's a lot of uh, strife that goes on between uh, China and Japan. And so to have the middleman in uh, Hong Kong there, yeah, uh, it's it's like one of those, oh, are they enemy or ally feeling for them is is the way that I would partake that. But I mean, honestly, it's everybody's an asshole. Every, everybody's an asshole. <laughs> and then uh, the announcer goes into long, in-depth introductions for our main characters and then yep. basically says, all right, these are the five guys. They're all the Shuffle Alliance. One of them's probably going to win. And here's a bunch of everybody else. Look at them. Yeah. Look at how weird they are. Well, I mean, as as she said, the the female announcer of the games, they are rumored to all have shuffle crests besides our known king of heart, uh, Domonkashu. So um, because of that, I feel like uh, we're using that as our uh, way to just say, oh, hey, uh, these are the people that we've seen throughout the entire series. These other ones are assholes. Oh, well. <laughs> so the... So, so the, the Shuffle Alliance thing is something that like everybody knows about. The Shuffle Alliance, uh, I think, is a known entity, but not necessarily known uh, for actively doing X, Y, or Z. Uh, it's how to put it. Maybe it's like a SEAL Team Six situation. You know they exist. You don't know exactly what they do, but you know they do good. So okay, that's that's the way that I would have taken that. Because yeah, yeah, it does seem a little off. That hey, we're a pseudo secret yeah, society, I know. <laughs> but uh, we're really leaning on that pseudo part. <laughs> and like now, the other you know no name Gundams they have like an unfair advantage because she went really in depth in all the skills and techniques that these Gundams have and says nothing about anyone else so like everybody knows all their secrets now yep yep they do <laughs> and one of the one of the other great things about this is that we give that equal level of uh, attention to these two individuals that should be nowhere near the the games Besides Master Asia, uh, I'm referring to uh, Gentle Chapman and uh, Nero there. Nikolai Nero. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Isn't it a chariot? Where the fuck the, the guy in the Nero's Gundam is? Yeah, something chariot. Uh, yeah, uh, Michelo Chariot. Thank yeah. you. So uh, Michelo Chariot there. Uh, very first episode. We saw his head get crushed, demolished, yeah. and left without the capacity to press on. So uh, there's no way that he should be allowed in, and yet he's yeah, here. Well, you know, Master Asia and, and Hong Kong guy doing some shady stuff. So not surprised. Yeah. Um, you know, we saw Master Asia get killed in Dragon Ball Z style, so it would have been safe to assume he's dead. He's clearly alive now, but, you know, this Devil Gundam could regenerate, so I buy that people could do something like that, too. Um, we've also seen illusions kind of happen with the, the, the Dragon Gundam, so... You know, I, I buy. I, I'm okay with sort of all that stuff. That seems fine. You bring these guys, these sort of villains, back, so that's fine too. Uh, what sure. is tough for me is that there is a Gundam horse. That is a little much. Uh, do they let him use that in the battle? Is that fair? I'm unsure if Funsaiki is used in any of the battles prior to the final. We will see them again. I'm going to give you the tiniest spoiler because it's more of a fun thing okay. than it is anything to involve itself in the story. Yeah. Funsaiki is an actual horse that pilots a horse Gundam. Th there, <laughs> there is a horse in the Gundam that pilots the horse Gundam? There, there is a horse Gundam fighter that gets suited up. <laughs> And pilots the horse Gundam. 
I was going to ask, like, does that have its own pilot? Does it work on its own? I don't know. But it just, it's just—it's piloted no, it's by a horse. Piloted by a horse. Sure. All right. You know, why not? Piloted <laughs> by a horse. Oh, my goodness. What a world we are in. Okay. Um, yes, you're right. It was certainly a recap episode. Um, not so bad as some of the ones I've seen in anime. So that's fine. Uh, also very much the like buy our toys episode, uh, which is, yeah. you know, the show obviously would need. Uh, Dumbo has a very interesting moment where he thinks to himself, Master Asia, how are you still alive? I defeated you. And then he out loud to Master Asia says, answer me. And I'm like, Domo, you had that thought in your head. He doesn't even know what you're talking about. But Master Asia then does answer as if he did read Domo's mind. Yeah. Well, so I will admit that I was turning my head away from the screen from time to time. But I do know that for the English dub, they made a few changes on that side. Uh, there were a number of pieces here where like, does Master Asia ask Domon to fight him uh, in the middle of their doing the opening ceremony bit? Uh, he, he does, but it's after this moment. Well, that's why I'm asking, because I I very strongly remember the two of them doing their uh, look, the East is burning red bit to light the, the torch in the center. Uh, having been like a uh ton in cheek uh moment between the two of them of like uh domo answer me and uh doing the whole bit that we saw back when they were still friendly with each other in shinjuku uh but in this one it seems like uh they have their mics set to one on one instead of everyone around them to say like i'm uh, i'm going to end you you must hate me fight me Come at me with all you've got. And then they continue to do their bit as though they're not having this conversation. So it's just it's bizarre to me that uh, this is the case when I'm watching on the Japanese side that they're having this little scuffle of words where I very strongly remember in the English dub that they didn't do that. Do they do that here? Um, Not that I remember or that stands out to me. I think it's one of the situations where they thought that this was not terribly important and made some changes to the text in order to uh, make sure lip flat lip flaps matched and got in a point or two more to make us not wholly hate Master Asia in the English for uh, a reason or two. Okay. So I have not been watching either of these shows in English, so uh, I can't say I I've said in uh, these shows in the past that I'm going to watch some of these pieces in English. I have yet to. Uh, I, I cram both episodes a day before, if not the day of. I'm not going to take the extra time to rewatch an episode in English after I just watched it in Japanese. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's fine. for you all to do. Yeah, it's OK. You, you know, do what you want to do. Just sort of something that jumped out at me. Other than that. Yeah, I don't know. Pretty, pretty simple episode here. Just sort of like oh, yeah. cool down. Then we just so we can reset for this new arc that we're doing. This al- almost kind of like a, a different genre um, from what the last 10 episodes were like, too, which is fine for me. Uh, this I, I'm sort of looking forward to more anyway. Um, well, so to that end, too, I'll say that this is very much following in line with how uh, you might have gotten a series to a season two in Japan uh, for most other anime, because around the uh, 12 or so episode mark is when you would cut if it was a short run series. But around the 24 to 26 mark is around the time that you would cut to have uh, a series one and a series two from from the show that you're watching. So. I am hoping that episode 26 or 27 finally gives us uh, trust you forever or trust your forever. Excuse me. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know. More recently, Gundams have been doing that, notably Iron Blooded Orphans and and, uh, Double Zero. But like that was sort of built into the design and there was production delays, too, that were sort of built into the scheduling. Uh, That's not sort of it's not really the case here. Um, But like it sort of works because we're at the halfway point. 
Um, and it was ostensibly the beginning of the show, too. So we've always been expecting this Gundam fight. We just took this detour where we became like this horror martial arts kind of uh, a montage battle for fantasy battle thing. Oh, oh, sweet summer child. Yeah. We ain't done. We're just. <laughs> yeah, we're, I imagine it's breather. going to come back. But like it, it's not it's not like it's like we didn't make sort of a hard cut. Or like this is really the return to form what we were expecting when the show kind of set up. And when you advertise this show, like the log line is about Gundam fighting. The universe is built around these, this tournament. Um, and the, the wrinkle thrown in is, is this devil Gundam. So that's fine. Yeah. No, I agree. I think they did a good job of naturally incorporating our clip show episode. There are a lot of shows that I've seen before that are very stilted in the way that they try to incorporate it, where they'll do one of my favorite shows, Kamen Rider. I was watching Kamen Rider Kuga earlier this year and they did a clip show episode where it was, they did like two or three to segment the story. And they would just go over the past 10 or so episodes while a fight is going on and just realize what, what has been happening recently? Why are things turning out this way? What is this next thing that's going to happen? Meanwhile, we're just intercutting uh, this clip show with scenes that are supposed to lead us between part A and part B. You know, it, it feels more janky than what this and uh, Ketra versus uh, Hero, because that's also pretty clip showy. Uh, there's a little bit in the middle, but it's not. Yeah, really, it's, not, it's, it's not a full clip show episode. It's don't not get really me wrong. its function. It was just like we have this guy giving this really, really long speech. Um, we don't want to just show him for a lot. Let's talk about because it's sort of finishing his arc uh, or or like getting to the next stage of his arc where he sort of comes to their side and comes to appreciate them. So I don't mind, you know, yeah. getting reminded of like, well, what is it that he's seeing? Because we've spent so much time assuming certain things about this character just based on how he's set up and based on our expectations of the genre. And now we have to now it really wants us to kind of reckon with those presumptions. I don't think my lunch had any MDMA or anything in it. I feel like I lost a good 20, 30 minutes. Did we jump into wing yet or? Well, I don't know. You just brought it up. So I wanted to defend. No, it. it's, it's funny. I'm just I'm goofing on you. I, I'm so glad that you enjoy this series because I'm starting to see some of what you see. Yeah. You know, I mean, should <laughs> I have something to respond, but are, are we done with G Gundam? Should we finish up some stuff there before I do respond? I, I think that this is a very easy G Gundam episode. Yeah. It's We've gone over all that we can, unless there's anything that you wanted to point out that was ridiculous to you or otherwise. Yeah, I, I love that this horse is piloted by a horse. Genius. Yeah. Um, no. So, like, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of this Gundam that's really messy, you know, and it's sort of a product of this 90s and, and not all of it works and... And there's a lot of stuff I would definitely like to fix about it. And, you know, when I step away from the show for enough time, I go like, eh, especially compared to some other Gundam shows. But when you get an episode like this, uh, some other episodes we've seen earlier, like they really hit these high notes really well. And like it mm -hmm. really does make the whole experience worth it. And so like that's probably these moments here are probably why this show sticks with me for so long, having watched it since 2001, 2002. Are we referring to Wing or, or G right wing, now? Wing. Okay. Yeah, I was responding to earlier where you, where you said, like, you kind of get, you're starting to get why I'm liking the show and stuff. And it's like moments yes. like these that just sort of tie together very well. And I've seen so many shows kind of have their villains. And usually the thing you do is like layers where, like, you discover something that's there that we find about them. And it can be like, oh, he's trying to save his home planet or blah, 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 whatever. But like these him and Lady Yun, like they both have like noticeable changes to their. They're not just like we're not finding something new, though there is more of that with trades. They're actually changing and growing and learning with this situation uh, along with our heroes. That's really exciting. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, there's there is a lot to talk about in wing this episode, I'll say. Yeah. So uh, so way back in episode 10, Bob, mm -hmm. you had mentioned that you really wanted Lady Un to be shot and you got oh, your I wish know. here. I was going to bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let, let's start with that. Yeah. Even though it's the end of the episode, let's start with that. Yes. So. I at that time, based on that version of the character, Absolutely. If in that moment she had been shot, 
I'd have been fine. Yeah. They have taken the time in the past handful of episodes to really develop her into a person instead of a one dimensional line. I, I feel like they did a good job of building up the moment from the beginning to the end of this episode to that point. I know she is shot. I don't believe she's dead. Uh, but I do acknowledge that while she has not become my favorite character or a wholly well-rounded character up to this point, she has developed. And I appreciate that she is more of a human than she had been. I, I also want to note that when her transformation device breaks, i.e. the glasses, she does change her vocal tonality and her, her state of mind. So I'm going to continue referring to her glasses as a henshin device. Okay. Um, yes. So one dimensional sort of not a, a fair assessment there, but like she started off in one place and now is somewhere very different. So it's not quite that she has more dimension. It's that, like what I said, she, she's arced. Like, this wasn't always in her. This was sort of why her and Trey's were kind of getting into little spats. It was why Trey sent her in the space to kind of learn this and learn what yeah. fighting is and to realize, you know, why the mobile doll is done. So, like, she learns, and it, it's sort of like, this is sort of a sad fate of a lot of characters, especially in anime, um, where, like, once they complete their arc, like, you kill them off. And so, like, so she spent all ep- all series so far trying to learn exactly how to carry out Trey's ideals, and she finally figures it out, and then boom, she's dead. And Troa spends all episode, all series, you know, being cold, stoic, emotionless soldier, and he sort of ends like pleading with Catra to find your heart again, find your humanity again, and that will be the thing that guides you forward. And then boom, dead. Uh, but that's why I think we should take some time to kind of talk about them and sort of how they've changed over the course of the series. Uh, I appreciated Trey's speech. Uh, I think that he did a great job of summarizing some of the things that we have seen prior to this in regards to uh not just him, but Un's understanding of Trey's, whether wholly true or not, uh, of him appreciating the death and the desire of the soldier to be willing to place all of their belief into their own life and put that on the table. Yeah, that so- a, a series of mobile dolls is not going to be able to do that. And that uh, certainly takes away from any of the meaning behind war to begin with. Yeah, so Catra has a line in the manga that he doesn't quite get in the anime, but then it, it blends nicely with something sort of, you know, with a, a bit Trey's has in the show and in the manga where Catra says, pure hearts suffer in a world where there is no answers to be found. But as Trey's is leaving the Roma Fella Foundation after his resignation, he talks about sort of the beauty of those pure hearts and how it makes them free and how it makes them sort of, you know, the exemplar, the paragons of what humanity is capable of in that moment. So Catra in this moment of sadness and bleakness has descended to, to hating his pure heart. But Troa, as he goes out, um, and Tr- Trey's the villain of our show so far are both like, no, you've got to find that back in yourself again, Catra. That's what's going to bring the future. You got to love our baby boy. <laughs> um, and so we, I, I have this note kind of written down, too. We might as well talk about it since, you know, we got we're on Lady Un's swan song. But, you know, in that episode, you would thought she had been in episode 19. You would thought she had been brainwashed by Trey's. And I sort of thought, like, is that really sort of the only thing that it could kind of be in that moment based on what you've seen so far? But now just checking in six episodes later, like what what do you think has affected this change in Lady Un from the one in episode 10 that was using the colonies as a bargaining chip? I believe that she is not necessarily not brainwashed. But I do believe that whatever has occurred in her is the sum of both the manipulations of Trey's as well as her own experience over time. So so why is it manipulation? Why is that where your brain goes? I'm not using manipulation in the general connotative where it's bad, negative, uh, with with malice. I'm just saying, like, to mold, to... Uh, put stress and pressure onto certain places in order to reach a, uh, a goal. So in this case, 
it's not that, oh, I'm going to make these machinations happen so that she comes to my side and bends to my will. I would have said that some episodes back. I believe he has tried to get her mind to accept information that she would not have otherwise seen. Yeah, I think mold is a fine word. Mold, teach, guide. Oh, you disagree I mean, with I'm that. I'm not going to put that much um, benevolence into it. Well, I do why think not? that there is a selfishness to it there somewhere, but it's not malicious. Okay, and so now he wants to be a loser also out of self selfishness? I'm still having to read on that. I am trying to look at this from my baby eyes, seeing what I've seen so far, applying um, my understanding of not just anime tropes, but also story structure in general. I'm unsure that I want to give the trust over to him because this is a ripe opportunity to start gaining favor in the audience to then pull the rug out from underneath them one more time. So I i am willing to follow along, but I'm doing so cautiously. <laughs> And then we what, I mean, uh, what, 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 what do you think I might be missing from your perspective? No, that's okay. I'm just you have to, several uh, times around in this. Listen, we got, we Is got there a point no, that no, you no, might no, want no. to make to me. We got half a show left. Um, just sort of poking and prodding, mm -hmm. uh, seeing where your head's at and kind of, we'll kind of keep checking back in as you know, our show kind of continues kind of growing and evolving, which is one of the things that makes watching this so many times easy because we're never sort of stuck in anything. You know, every five or six episodes, our battle lines change, our alliances change, what we think about the characters change mostly. So, like, it's, it's kind of easy for me to have we watched it as many times as I have. Mm -hmm. So it's fun. To, it's I, always, I would offer to yeah. do the same for you with G Gundam, but we have horses driving <laughs> horses. Mecca, so. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's all right. It's okay. So it's just fun. Like uh, yeah, this, fun. This, this, this episode I sort of like, we get another fun one, um, you know, and then we do sort of what G Gundam is doing now is we do the sort of reset. We cool down for a little bit. We're in a very different space when you come back. Um, and But like, it's a very interesting space. We finally get to see what Raleen has been up to all this time uh, oh. in the next handful of episodes. So it'll, it'll be good. All right. Do we get our new opening or ending? It, uh, as of the next episode no, or two, do you it, think? Uh, so th technically, the next episode kind of closes off the halfway point as big and climactic as this moment feels. There's a little cleanup mm -hmm. to do, and then we do kind of the little reset. Okay. Um, so the opening will actually take a while. I have a theory why it the second opening comes so late in the series, but we'll talk about mm -hmm. that when it happens. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure that when I finally do see Trust Your Forever happen on G's side, I, I'll have some speculation on that. But um, I feel like with this series so far, it has done a great job of setting up opposing expectations. We we assume at the beginning of this story that we're going to have this one battle, this one war that will last the entirety of our year with these kids and they crush that within the first <laughs> 10 to 15 episodes. So we have these kids who are wayward trying to still fight for their belief instead of just accepting that. Okay. Well, the people are with them. So fuck it. But I, I'll ask, are we about to go into a time skip? Um, yes. Yeah. And about, okay. and I think in about three ish episodes, we have a time skip. Mm hmm. OK, yeah, I, I I don't know whether or not we're going to see years or for you, it might be just weeks or months. But um, I am looking forward to seeing what this might mean, because now we have Hero, who is this stunted child that doesn't know how to express his emotions properly, having to uh, finally sit with Katra and hopefully learn some of that kind heartedness and the the interactions there while allowing uh, Katra to learn from Hero how to not be so uh, hard on your sleeve that you're going to get destroyed. I think that's going to be important. And then in the same way, knowing that we're going to see Wu Fei and uh, uh, Duo working with each other because Duo is so aloof and lively and human compared to a kid that can put himself into a suspended animation. He's got martial arts powers. That's fine. Yeah, no, controlled breathing I get. But, like, 
It's yeah, just, I, I wish it they, seems like a lot for a 15 year old man. Yeah, I wish they had translated it that way. I mean, I don't know. Or, or like that feels like an easy substitution. Like that's what I would do in a remake. I wish they had said that in the manga. Uh, I, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. I, the spin animation is a little too far. It was just like Hero and the brain waves in episode three. Like we don't really need that to get the point across and it t- makes it harder to kind of get into it. Agreed. But like, so this hero, your read on hero, I kind of want to discuss because we have, cause that's you, uh, to me, that was sort of more Troa is sort of like has this vacuum where hero's the one who has to tell Troa that begins his arc that gets us to here of like, the only way to give a good life is to follow your emotions and so when Trace is giving a speech about kind of the purity and, and finding sort of true emotion and the self-discovery in battle, I think he's describing Hero. I think that's why and he, and he just and all the other kids have it to a little lesser degree. I think that's what he admires about these pilots so much is that they've found what he's lost being locked up in traditional warfare and, and being in this organization that cares so much about keeping the old ways of their uh, uh, that they've sort of established and that they've profited from. So I, I think, you know, as you go forward, try to look at what Tiro's doing and why, and, you know, don't look at it through a lens of emotional stunting, but look at it like this is his expression of his emotions. What does that mean about him? And what should I gain from that a- a- as I look at my own life? Okay, but I'm going to acknowledge something that we had been discussing uh, like half of this series so far back. We were talking about how Hero seems to be the only one that is not uh, of a background that would have uh, necessarily shown that he is capable outside of being under the tutelage of Dr. J. We have no knowledge of him having ever had parents. We have no knowledge of him ever having had a normal childhood. As far as we're to understand, Hero... If he's not a robot, which you've told me before, he's not a robot. Yes, thank God. He is not, he is not what we would call traditionally humane. That's not to say that he is not human. That is not to say that he is not humane, but he is not traditionally so. And my curiosity is whether or not his emotions, which are there, like he showed his frustration, not to the same anime degree as other characters might, but he showed his emotions towards Katra, who was actively being a malicious force in the moment. And then his selfishness caused um, Troa to throw himself in the way to save Hero's life. So Troa got growth. I have to wonder whether or not he is as emotionally literate as Katra is. Katra while being a stunted baby child is still at least seemingly more emotionally literate than hero. And so I, what I mean is I want to see how their interactions might guide both of them in this trauma, uh, traumatic moment. Yeah. Catra is certainly much more emotionally expressive in a traditional way. And I think it sort of then makes sense that he would have these wild swings because that's what I've kind of noticed with those people in real life. Um, those people that kind of thrive off emotions and identify themselves through their emotions. Um, they're sort of big in either direction. They have a hard time kind of finding a medium. Uh, and as for Hero, uh, you know, what this show does so well that you've kind of alluded to is, you know, uh, b- setting up expectations and then breaking them. Like, I think it really wants to lead you in a certain direction to force you to kind of re-examine something. And so what it's offering in Hero is kind of a new way at looking at sort of uh, like emotional, the way people express emotions, um, what it means to be human. And so it's easy to kind of look at him and think what you think. And, and I, you know, it's an easy, that's a read I had early on too. But then he says something weird, like the only way to give, good, live a good life is to follow your emotions. And you have to think, oh, that's weird. That's not what I think that you're doing. And now that has to kind of be in the back of your head each time you're kind of watching it because it's never really directly stated again until Trey's has this speech here um, mm-hmm. talking about that very sort of principle that is best exemplified in a battle when your life is on the line. Um, because not only do you sort of learn something is there, but the people that you're fighting for, they kind of gain something from the consequences of it and why those engineers didn't want 
mobile dolls to be produced. And what they were afraid of is that like if button pushing is the new face of war, it's just much easier for us to make that decision. There are no real consequences that we see or feel, you know, viscerally. And Trey's and Hero are sort of like, well, that's why we need soldiers. That's why we have to get up close and look at our enemies in the eyes and put our lives on the line because only then will the citizens that we're fighting for, you know, look look more trepidatiously at the acts of war and like, is this something worth fighting for? And only if it absolutely is, should we do it? Is it your read of the text or is it going to be more blatantly stated within the text that soldiers are effectively martyrs or that uh, soldiers are willing to be sacrificial lambs. Well, so I, I, I don't know if I would put, I don't know if I would read it as sacrificial lambs because that, you know, there's also this trace thing of being like, of like finding Nirvana ish almost in a battle, like finding Mm -hmm. that pure essence of being in human will's desire to fight. And what Lady Un sort of admires in these Gundam pilots and why she wants to release them and why Trace likes them is like they're willing to fight even though they they've lost everything even though they have been defeated they're not stopping because what they believe in and what they want to bring about means so much to them that they are are sort of trying to forge history through that will and that's what is admirable to these two characters that started off as villains is you know that humanity has the ability to impact such change on its environment out of these strong emotional pursuits and connections. Um, But we can kind of keep examining the role of a soldier uh, in our world because it's both what the show really examines and then what the show decides by the end is ultimately re-examined and the the consequences of it are dealt with that decision in the movie. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Well, I think now we can sort of take a, 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 a we can go the we can see the way we go. Do you want to take that again, friend? Or no, it's fine. Like sand through the hourglass, this is the way that we go. Well, what? Where did you go this week, Bob? Uh, this week I went to honestly i i think that i was emotionally checked out for g gundam to bring me anywhere because i as soon as i started seeing the ceremony i was like okay this is just a lot of clip show cool i'm glad that next week we get to have fun things but for now clip show uh and as far as uh gundam wing is concerned um you bet your sweet ass i uh, yelled towards my wife to look at the uh, Death Scythe Hell when it came on screen <laughs> uh, because unfortunately I had to start watching this morning instead of last night. Okay. So uh, she was already working at her desk in the living room while I was watching on the television. So she got to see the thing. She didn't get to watch the episode. She's probably going to double back and watch these after the fact. Okay. Um, but besides that, uh, fucking. Yeah, I got nothing. I didn't go anywhere but uh, the couch and then my phone and then uh, to the office to manage some shit. So, yeah. So I went two places this week. One this is sort of about clip shows in general, but I want to save that for the Gundam Wing ones. Um, mm-hmm. But the other place is sort of in the, the G. Oh, sorry. The Gundam Wing specifically is like it's an episode, just you know, no matter how many times I've seen it, that always kind of gets me. It always moves me a bit. Um, you know, Trey's this, you know, declaration that I want to be a loser. I always loved that whole speech. In fact, I used to use in my rotation when I would have to do monologues and auditions. No uh, shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. I love that speech. It's probably one of the best in the, the series. Um, I also really love Lady Yun's kind of kind of uh, closing remarks as well. Um, yeah. So like they're, they're moving. And like what I sort of mentioned earlier is like that it's not really a perfect show. It has a lot of messy stuff. It has a lot of stuff I'd like to fix. And, you know, as your know, filmmakers are kind of coming up and learning and growing and grooming themselves and sort of what Hollywood kind of does too, what it sort of puts in our mind is like this need for like perfection. 
you know, tight story structure, you know, very taut character construction, like it all has to be sort of flawless. And we think that we are expecting kind of flawless things. And this show has this slow start and you could easily tune it out. But like, you know, clearly if I'm being moved and have watched this one so many times over a show like Breaking Bad, um, Mm. which is what we would call more of like a perfect show, you know, this one has impacted me more. Like there's perhaps something more at work than just technique uh, and craftsmanship, something that's more valuable in the, the process of making art and telling stories besides following the numbers or saving the cat or all this kind of, you know, bullshit that yeah. we really just use to kind of make this cottage industry of, you know, marketing storytelling advice and script cleanups. Y- your script doesn't have to be perfect as long as it sort of works in a way. It finds some element of truth and honesty Um and that's what this show can do in these high moments, and that's what makes it easy for me to have watched it ten times over. You know, we're almost on twenty years now. Like, yeah, it, you know, every other year I seem to be watching this show, and I'm sharing with other people, and it's all sort of working. If you're willing to kind of let yourself be opened and emotionally engaged with it, um, and that's what it can do very well, despite a lot of the messiness that kind of makes your brain be like, huh? So. You know, just keep that in mind, listeners, as you're trying to tell your own stories. Don't worry about your image looking pristine. Don't worry about having the right gear. Just try to get it, you know, just try to find that truth. And maybe you just improvise it and just let kind of that moment happen, because that's what's more important and more connecting to us as being real. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. Now we can take a walk over to the nerd corner. Let's take a walk to the nerd corner where we will talk about a lot of nerd stuff. Yeah. So very similar to last week, I got to finish going through the, the last of these new Criterion collections that I got during that big sale. Um, mm-hmm. Two great movies that I love from great filmmakers that I love, you know, Fire Walk With Me, the Twin Peaks movie, mm-hmm. which has this unfortunate connotation of like being, it was vilified when it came out. People didn't like it. Um, because it, it just didn't, they said it was like, it wasn't as funny or weird, even though it is plenty weird as the show was. And, uh, you know, a lot of the characters went in there and I, but like the going to be like, it wasn't as funny as we want. I thought, I thought, I always think to myself, so people were mad that this movie about, uh, somebody getting uh, about incest and murder wasn't funny enough for them. What, what, what did you expect? What did you want? But this DVD also has something interesting, much like Blue Velvet had two extra hours of footage that was cut out. Twin Peaks had an hour and a half of footage that was cut out that has a little bit of these lighter moments that has sort of the other characters that don't appear in the film that you probably mm. would have wanted to see from the TV show other than the couple who clearly just didn't want to be part of the show anymore, it seems. Um, so, if you're yeah. referring to who I think you are. Well, that's one of them, but they, you know, they needed her for the story, so... Like they just sort of recast her and like nobody talks about it, but really, yeah. Um, so to to be certain, yeah. in case the other people over the phone here uh, don't know who we're talking about, Lara Flynn Boyle and uh, Kyle McLaughlin. No, Kyle McLaughlin, you still have in the movie. Okay, uh, that's what I was curious about. He wants to be part of the show because he's you know he's the star of the later part. No, but yeah. Lara Flynn Boyle for some reason. Doesn't want to be part of Twin Peaks anymore, and but she's you know Laura Palmer's best friend. So if you're doing the week that Laura Palmer right before she dies, she's got to be in there. So yeah. they just sort of cast some other actress, and it takes it takes me a while to realize that she is supposed to be that character. Like they don't they don't even say her name for a bit. So you think it's just one of Laura's other school friends for a while. Maybe that's how they dodge it is you don't get to know who she is until the end. And then you can be like, oh, I, I ate, uh, I drank the Kool-Aid. I'm yeah, here. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Who knows? But um, and they don't even like they don't even look alike. Like they, they're not even like vaguely similar. But that, that, it's neither here nor there. But there are other like side characters you know, like Jack Nance and, and a few of these other and, and Laura from Blore's parents, like they're all in there in these deleted scenes. Mm. Um, and there's even like an extended ending that I'm actually kind of glad that they 
cut out because I think the way the movie ends is sort of exactly what the movie needs. But like, yeah, so like they're most of the characters that wanted to be in the show, they're in these kind of deleted scenes. Um, but you like, know who's notably absent. You can be like, oh, OK, that's interesting. Um, or maybe even, you know, some of the characters from season two, David Lynch just didn't want in there because they weren't supposed to be part of it. Um mm. So, you know, that that is great just just for those that's hour and a half of extra movie. And like it's insane that David Lynch is making these movies on very small budgets and they're and yet they're twice as long as a normal film. Whereas so like he did for, he did Blue Velvet for four million dollars and it's a four hour movie. Dune, four hour movie, uh like a like a, I don't know, five hundred, six hundred million dollars to make. It's insane that this guy can do shoot so much and get that in a tight production schedule uh and then just be like yeah half of this we we don't need it's not working the other mm-hmm. movie code unknown by great austrian filmmaker michael haneke um very famous for kind of decrying the he calls it like the curse of um, like progression, like industrial progression, where after World War II, when they got to build, it was great, but it didn't sort of bring, and it brought technological stability to the region and economic stability to the region, but didn't bring along the emotional growth that was needed to kind of go along with it and bring us into a new age. So this is a movie that sort of begins with like this kind of scene that kind of blows up and explodes you know, emotionally on on a Paris street with between four characters. And then you kind of follow uh, each of their lives kind of after that moment and how it's kind of affected. He had a movie earlier that was sort of like the opposite, where you saw these disparate characters lead to this moment of tragedy. This is now the reverse. A very great movie, very strong technical skills, both from the Criterion. I recommend finding both of them, Fire Walk With Me and Code Unknown. Bob, what do you have in the nerd corner this week? Uh, well, for me, I uh, I recently started watching some uh, newer YouTubers because we all get into that rut of uh, or those of us who watch YouTube on the regular get in that rut of watching the same handful of people. And you eventually go, uh, what, is there anything else on? But uh, <laughs> I don't want to try something because they, they're this looks uh, the Sphere Hunter is a wonderful uh, channel that I started watching mostly because she does a great uh, synopsis and retrospective on um, several different titles. Uh, I'd seen her do two that I would highly recommend. One being the Parasite Eve series and how it went from amazing and in necessity of having more uh, side projects or sequels and then falling from grace because obviously Square didn't want to give them any love. But then on the other side, Devil May Cry and gained to hear about not only the story, but also all of the uh, production issues that occurred during a number of the games and how it went from uh, a great open to a fall to a huge rise to another fall to what appears to be yet another rise. So um, if you're interested at all, in hearing about different gameplay techniques to use in some of these games or to understand why a series might not get the love that it probably deserves. Check those out. I've also been digging into uh, Shin Megami Tensei stuff, and I might even uh, start a file on my wife's copy of SMT4. All right. Well, that sounds great. Definitely check that out. It's easy. Those links will be in the show notes. Well, it's that time again, Bob. I'd like to thank you for joining us this week. Do you have any plugs? The silicone ones are in the dishwasher right now, but for the things that I do, you can find me on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, and a slew of other places by my handle, BobScaryVOA. You can also go to BobScaryVOA.com to listen to my demos, of which I have been reluctant to uh, re-record, but should be doing soon. Uh, You can certainly go ahead and fund my ass by either (laughs) hiring me to do that or buying me a coffee or two and let me know if there's something non-commercial you want done, or even subscribing to my Patreon, where all I ask you to do, toss me a few bucks, and I say, thanks! Uh, and maybe we can uh, have some chitter-chattery if that occurs. 
And I am your host, Patrick Scale. You can find my features, documentaries, animation, short films, video essays, behind-the-scenes footage, and so much more at quixoticunited.com and social media, presumably with a similar sounding name. Thank you all for listening. Bob, tell the audience why Twister is your favorite movie. Don't you dare slander my name by attaching it to that movie ever again. I swear, I'll kill you. Tell the